Hi, my name is Cleo. I'm a senior at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my summer research project at the ICOMP Bio RU at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, working with Dr. Meng Jun Xie and Dr. Hong Chen. My research project is a little bit about factors that control the spread of coronavirus disease. Before I start talking about that, I'm going to give a little background that I think it's important to know before we start talking about the research. The first thing I want to do is provide a little background about the coronavirus pandemic. The coronavirus was discovered in late 2019 in Wuhan, China. It is a novel virus, which means that no one has ever been exposed to it before in the human population. That means there is no prior herd immunity. Because of this, it was able to spread very quickly. In August, at the time of this recording, there are 5.6 million cases in the United States and over 23 million cases worldwide. Again, because there is no prior immunity to the coronavirus, um, those who would get very sick would quickly overwhelm the healthcare system if they were all to get sick at once. Therefore, public health officials have started to become proponents of flattening the curve, which means spreading out their infections so that not everyone gets sick at once. This pre prevents many deaths because not only does it prevent deaths from coronavirus, it also prevents deaths that could have been prevented, such as car crashes or accidents, by ensuring that there is room in the hospital when those accidents happen. Another important measure to study when we are studying outbreaks is the r naught or net reproductive rate of the virus. r naught is a number that tells you, on average, how many people get infected when they come into contact with one infected person. However, this number can vary depending on the method used to estimate r naught, the data used to estimate r naught, and whether protective public health measures are in place or not. Because of this, depending on multiple public health measures, the data, and different geographic regions, current estimates of coronavirus R0 range from 1.4 to 6.49. However, this is actually a bad sign because if an R0 is above 1, it means that your epidemic is constantly growing because each person who is infected with coronavirus is infecting, on average, more than one person, so the epidemic is growing. Public health measures are needed to bring the r naught below one so that each person who has coronavirus infects less than one person on average to control the epidemic. There have been several public health measures used to control the pandemic and flatten the curve. The first measure is social distancing, or staying six or more feet apart from anyone who does not live in your household, which reduces the probability of infection. The next is hand hygiene, washing your hands for more than 20 seconds. Lastly, masks have been used to control the pandemic because if everyone is wearing a mask, there is less respiratory droplets being in the air, so therefore there is a less risk of transmission. Social distancing has shown to work to contain the pandemic. In panel C of the graph below, we can see the mobility scores on the y-axis and the dates on the x-axis. And what we see is a fluctuation followed by a steep drop as people started to stay home in March. This correlates with panel D, which shows an increase in cases up into about March where the case numbers start to plateau. This is the, um, a prime example of social distancing being used to flatten the curve. An influential model recently suggested that masks worked to control the pandemic. They ran several simulations, including people with 20% 20 20 of people wearing masks, 50% of people wearing masks, and 80% of people wearing masks. They found that at 80% of people wearing masks in an 80% effective way, meaning that 80% of transmission was blocked, the curve was almost completely flattened. In addition, another factor which might control the spread of coronavirus is the temperature. Hotter weather and increased humidity were associated with lower case counts, perhaps suggesting that the coronavirus could eventually become a seasonal disease rather than a worldwide pandemic. Now I'm going to talk about the methods that I used to collect the data and analyze it for this study.
The first source of my data is the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Tracker. At the time of making this PowerPoint, there were 14.7 million cases. The next thing was to get mobility data because that is a proxy for social distancing. I used Apple and Google mobility data to analyze how people were moving around before and during the pandemic. Once the data was aggregated, I analyzed it in R using dplyr from the tidyverse. I calculated R0 from the R0 package. Lastly, the weather data was parsed in Python using the ERA5 dataset. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the results or factors that I found were correlated with the spread of coronavirus disease. My first result is a correlation plot showing what variables were correlated together. We can see that the strongest correlations were the mobility data, which correlated very strongly together, as you can see from the dark blue circles. However, there were certainly a negative correlation between um, mobility data and R0, especially when the R0 was lagged by two weeks to account for the incubation period of the virus and to account for delays in testing. First, I'd like to ask the question, how mobility changed over the progression of the pandemic? This is the percent change in visits to retail and re recreation from Google mobility data. We can see that um, over time, the graph becomes very dark, showing that there's a decrease in percent visits to those places. However, as the pandemic progressed, the graph becomes lighter and lighter, returning to almost baseline levels. This graph shows the percent change in residential movement from Google mobility data. It shows that across the progression of the pandemic, people started to stay home more and more. However, as the weather warmed up, they went back out again. This graph shows the Apple mobility values versus temperature by state. We can see that in some states, a change in mobility was significantly associated with a change in temperature. This shows only the states which had significant correlations between mobility and temperature. What's interesting here is that we can see that cold states such as Arkansas and Montana showed that when the weather got warmer, people went out more. However, in warm states like the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii, when the weather got warmer, people went inside. There was a correlation between temperature and R0 in certain states as well. In general, for most states, it looked that as temperature increased, R0, or the growth of the pandemic, generally decreased. However, this trend is not uniform in all directions for all states. This graph shows the Apple Mobility Social Distancing metrics on the x-axis and R0 with a two-week lag introduced to account for the incubation period of the virus on the y-axis. If you were to just look at this graph, you would see that it would appear that as people went outside more, as Apple Mobility social distancing metrics increased, the R0 decreased, which would be contrary to everything that we've heard so far about social distancing being used to control the pandemic. However, when you look at the time series data, it does show that at the beginning of the pandemic, R0 was very high, and at the middle of the pandemic, R0 was sort of, you know, hovering around 1.5. And in June and July, the tailor end um, of the first wave of the pandemic, we can see that R0 was pretty, pretty low. It was around 1 to 1.5. Looking at each state tells a different story. In Massachusetts, the R0 started very high, but over the progression of the pandemic, it was contained to hover around 1.2 to 1.5. This still shows a growing epidemic, however. In Florida, similarly, R0 started out very high and dropped as the nation went onto lockdown. However, in July and June, R0 started to tick back up again to around 1.5 to 1.7. This is a better visualization of R0. We can see that at the beginning of the pandemic, it was quite high, around 2.5 to 3, but then it started to drop and stabilize. I plotted R0 and mobility scores on the same axis so we could see how they travel together. 
I transformed the mobility scores to be logarithmic so that they would fit on the same axes. The behavior of these graphs do show a relationship. Lastly, I asked whether masks were able to control the pandemic. I selected states which had mask mandates statewide for four weeks or more to create these box plots. We can see that for a lot of states, after mask mandates were used, um, the r naught was significantly lower than the previous. However, not all states followed this trend. A Kruskal Wallace chi-square de Nova showed that there was a highly significant difference between the two populations before and after. However, the difference did vary by state. Now I'm going to interpret the results that I have in context with other literature that has come out during the pandemic. First, I'd like to just quickly summarize the results. Mobility scores dropped in both Apple and Google during the beginning of the pandemic, but they eventually increased to baseline levels. Following that, trends in r naught generally increased downward, but then ticked upwards again as people started going out again. Lastly, mask usage correlated with a decrease in r naught, which was expected. One confounding variable in this study is that at the beginning of the pandemic, there were delays in testing, which could have led to falsely exponential growth. This is because at the beginning of the pandemic, the testing infrastructure was still being created and tests were being reported as they were processed by the lab. If the lab had a backlog, for example, that would lead to many cases being reported on the same day and would falsely allow you to infer that there had been exponential growth. Another interesting thing is that whether a country voted Republican or Democrat was correlated with their adherence to social distancing policies. However, this is not saying that just because a county votes Republican or Democrat means that they are going to social distance. It just shows that it's important to consider the socio-political factors that would allow people to social distance or not. Just to summarize, a few other important factors to consider in the analysis of the coronavirus pandemic would be the lag time that would be impacted by delays in testing and reporting, as well as the incubation time of the virus, which is said to be around two weeks, but there is certain variation in that. In addition, there are socioeconomic and political factors that should be considered that might contribute to whether social distancing can be adhered to or not. For example, if there is an area with a lot of people who are essential workers, then they would not be able to social distance as effectively as an area where people live and they're able to mostly work from home. Lastly, this pandemic is an unfolding event and therefore there should be continued research into other factors that might help to control its spread. However, this analysis is far from complete. In the future, I'd love to include more variables, such as hospitalization rates and testing delays. Lastly, I'd also like to um, talk about undocumented asymptomatic infections. It is estimated that between 10 and 40% of people who are infected with coronavirus never experience any symptoms, so they would never get tested, yet they would be able to spread the disease to others. These graphs show the simulation of um, possible infections to account for asymptomatic cases, showing that on average there can be up to 40 or 50 percent more cases than what is currently being tested for. Lastly, I'd like to improve using r naught because another um, way to analyze the data instead of just having r naught, which does have certain limitations, is to use percent positive changes in cases between day to day to show whether the epidemic is growing or to use percent positive tests as a metric to show how many people in an area are actually infected with coronavirus. In conclusion, social distancing, weather, and mask wearing were associated with r naught, but this did vary by state. This points to the fact that more research is necessary to determine the pandemic's impact and how widespread it is. Here is the abstract for this research project.
And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Meng Zhenxie and Dr. Hong Chin for being such amazing mentors this summer. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Jamory Moore, Megan Doman, and Chloe Pryor. Lastly, I'd also like to thank the NSF for providing the financial support to run this project.